better than never, right? We're here. God is good. We thank him for his blessings towards us and for bringing us here. You'll see on the screen, who are you? Who are, who are you? You can think about that as we go through today. That is the theme of our youth presentation for today's um, program. Throughout the day, you will hear the question, who are you? And think about it as you answer that question, not necessarily out loud, but to yourself, right? Um, the rest of the week. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Mark 2 and verse 27. The Sabbath was made for all mankind and was instituted in Eden before the fall of man. The Creator called it my holy day. In Isaiah 58 and verse 13, Christ announced himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. Matthew 12 and verse 8. Beginning with creation, it is as old as the human race. And having been made for man, it will exist as long as man shall exist. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Okay, let us bow our heads. <coughs> our Father, what in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We want to thank you again for taking us here uh, today to worship you on your holy Sabbath day. Uh, God, and protect each and every one of us as we worship today. And for those who are on their way, give them traveling mercy, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Our first song is number 618, 618. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. 618, 618. Ask our youth to come closer to the front. Amen. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. He soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss From victory on to victory His army shall he lead Till every foe is vanquished And Christ is Lord indeed Stand up Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey, for to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day, he that our men now serving against Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, he dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watch it. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strength will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's wrong. To Three, three, zero, first and last. 
take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love, at the impulse of Thy love. Take my life and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. Our opening song is number 539. 539 will sing the first and second stanza, first and second stanzas only. Five, three, nine, first and second stanzas only. Please stand. After which our superintendent will take over. I will early seek the Savior. I will learn of him each day. I will follow in his footsteps. I will walk the narrow way. For he loves me, yes, he loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves me, died to save me. This is why I love him so. Second stanza. I will hasten where he bids me. I am not too young to go in the pathway where he leadeth. Not too young his will to know. For he loves me, yes, he loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves me, died to save me. This is why I love him so. Please be seated. Our superintendent is Christopher Rampasad. He'll now take over. Good morning, Church. Happy Sabbath. Today's Youth Day is titled, Who Are You? We all have an identity separate from the world around us. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Does anybody know what this means to them? I can repeat it if you guys would like me to. Repeat it. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17. Um, for me, that tells me that um, in my life, before knowing Christ, I lived a certain way, I thought a certain way, um, and once I became a born-again Christian, my focus is not my life anymore or what I thought or my own will, but my life has changed to where I am living out God's will and trying to live what, the way he would have me to live. So I've changed in a sense now that I have, I am practicing the mindset of Christ. So now uh, 
moving forward in my life, that's that's where the big changes come in. To me, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone, and a new life has begun. When you value yourself, I do see a change in character from worthless sinner to worthy follower, to love, respect, and carry yourself as a special child of God is what Christians are here to do. When you value and love yourself, you become better equipped you become better equipped to love and value others. So if you want to be valued first, find your own worth, appreciate it, confess it, and live up to it. We will now have scripture reading by Sister Charlotte Howard, followed by prayer by Sister Jadine Crosby. Let us pray. God, thank you for another day. Thank you for letting us be able to come to church and to do your worship. And for those who are still coming, I hope you could protect them on the way. And I hope you could help us to learn more about you. Just in my prayer, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Today I'm here to welcome visitors and members into the house of the Lord. The church is a place of learning, and I hope and pray that we all leave here with something new to keep us through the coming week. Relax and enjoy the youth day. Thank you for coming, and happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Jody, and I will be doing our mission story for this morning. So this mission story's title is titled Out of the Supernatural. So for Oleg, getting married meant more than gaining a companion and friend. It meant living with someone with fantastic powers. He learned about his wife's powers when she offered relief from his constant headaches. Would you like me to put my hand on your head, Sveltana asked. Without waiting for a reply, she placed a hand on his head and immediately the headache vanished. Oh, that helped, Oleg exclaimed with surprise. After that, whenever Oleg had a headache, he knew where to go. He didn't know how Sveltana, his wife, did it, but he wasn't worried. There are many things he didn't understand in Soviet Latvia, but the one thing that he knew was for sure that there was no God. Oleg had been raised in an atheist home, and he, like many people in atheistic Latvia, did not believe in God. But he did believe in unseen forces. Sveltana enjoyed reading magazines about the supernatural, and she had connections with an unseen force. Once, when Oleg was fixing the car, Sveltana heard a voice telling her to use her mental powers to turn off the car engine. Before she could even think about it, the engine shut off. She also heard the voice telling her to do other things. Oleg didn't think much about the voice until it told his wife to kill him and their three children. Sveltana refused the order and sank into a deep sadness. For three days, she wanted to die. Oleg was scared, and he left with their children. Sveltana's mother called for an ambulance, and Sveltana ended up in a psychiatric hospital. When Oleg saw the psychiatrist, he asked if his wife would ever be released from the psychiatric hospital. I cannot keep her here because she's not insane, the psychiatrist said. She doesn't need a hospital. She needs a church. Oleg was shocked. A Soviet psychiatrist was recommending Christianity? Oleg and his family had no connections to any church. He wasn't sure what to do. In desperation, Sveltana's mother asked an elderly woman at her workplace, do you know where I can find a Bible or talk to someone about God? The woman happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist. 
Of course I know, she said. My pastor can speak with your daughter and give you a Bible. When Sveltana was released, she and Oleg went to the pastor and described their situation. The pastor had no doubt that evil forces were at work. Pray and God can deliver you, he said, and you also must come to church. Sveltana and the children started going to church. In three months, she was baptized. Oleg was relieved that his wife found peace, but he wasn't really convinced that there was a God, or that he needed God anyways. Sometimes he made fun of Sultana and their children for praying, and he also asked why they went to church every Sabbath. Come and see, Sveltana asked. Oleg went finally, and he liked what he saw. When the pastor offered to study the Bible together, he agreed. Then he gave his heart to God and was baptized. Later, all three of their children were also baptized. Now, I am a pastor of the church, Oleg says. I never thought that I would be a pastor. Oleg is actually more than a pastor. Since 1998, he has been an Adventist youth leader, working with Pathfinders and engaging children in campouts and other activities. Sveltana has worked closely at his side. Oleg will help oversee this quarter's 13th Sabbath project in Latvia's capital, Riga, a center of influence where Pathfinders, children, and families can participate in language classes, sports, and other Christ-centered events. Thank you for your generous offering today that will help this project and a youth camp for Pathfinders in Montenegro. Luke 10, 19 says, Jesus said that, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So let this story serve as a reminder of our, our identity in Christ and the authority that comes with that identity as well. Thank you. Okay, good morning and happy Sabbath. For this morning's scripture reading, we'll be taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. It reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be to... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us before him in the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Amen. Good morning again, church. Uh, now we we will be showcasing a narrative. Now we will be showcasing a narrative titled um, Ident "Personal Identity." Follow me. Walk with me. Learn from me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good kind of come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. See for yourself. Make an educated guess. Seeing is believing. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, Behold. Behold. here it comes. 
What do you mean? Every time the Bible says, behold, something amazing is about to be done. Behold. It is a powerful word. It gets your attention. It screams, something important is about to be revealed. Behold. The word occurs 1,103 times in the entire Bible. How do you know? Actually, I don't want to know. When Jesus saw Nathanael, he said, Behold, a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. David said, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up, you know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You know everything I do. Everything? Everything. everything. You know what I'm going to say, even before I say it, Lord. Well, at least God knows what I'm going to say. Amen. Amen. He knows us. He sees us. sees us. He loves us. David said, How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? Are you sure? Absolutely. Why do you ask? If God thinks that way about me, God is either wrong or... More right than you. Maybe he sees you. The best of you. The real you. Better than you see yourself. That's amazing. Daniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Truly I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Dear Jesus, open the eyes of my heart. That I may know the hope of your calling. The extravagant work you have done for me. For, for us. us, come and see. And that is our narrative. Can all of the teachers for lesson study please stand? Uh, can you please pray for us? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another beautiful Sabbath day, so sunny and bright on the outside. May our hearts be filled with joy and gladness, knowing that we are sharing this blessed day with you. Bless us now as we study your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are now breaking out into our uh, lesson study classes. For the adults, we'll have our Sabbath school as a whole. Elder Smith or Sister Olay will be both, will be your teachers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Wilson. And let me give a big shout out to our youth for leading out this morning. Um, we are to indeed encourage and try our endeavor best to nurture and share a close relationship with our youth because, as you all know, they are the elders and teachers and preachers of tomorrow. And uh, it is our duty to get them ready. Amen? Amen, amen. Ella Thomas was supposed to be here this morning to have Sabbath school. Unfortunately, he is absent, and therefore, Sister Ruby and I will team up and um, along with you. So please, let us have a good lesson study. Father in heaven, I thank you, dear God, for this moment to be in your presence, to share your word with your children. I pray that as Sister Ruby and myself attempt to explain or to just to facilitate this lesson study, your Holy Spirit will take full control. This I ask in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 This morning, happy Sabbath. This morning we are going to be looking at lesson 14, and this lesson concludes 
this quarter's lessons. We have been focusing our attention on the book of Ephesians. So many wonderful lessons are presented in this lesson, not only for the early Christians, but for us as Christians living in the last days. We are the Laodicean church, we are the last church, and we are just as encouraged in 2023 as when the church started after Jesus ascended to heaven. And so um, our title that we will be looking at this morning is Ephesians in the Heart. It doesn't make sense if we study the book of Ephesians and it doesn't do something for us. And that change takes place where? In the heart. And our memory text is taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Let's read it together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right. We are saved by grace, not by our works. And the Apostle Paul wanted to make that a very strong point in the lives of the Ephesians. No matter how good we are or how many good works we have done, our works will not save us. It's only by grace. And what does the Bible call grace? What is it? All right. It's unmerited favor. What else? And how else could we describe it? Grace. It's a gift, isn't it? Right. It's a gift given to us by Jesus Christ. And we accept it through faith, for by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, not of your works, or not of our works, lest anyone should boast. So, as we look at our lesson this week, we want to ask ourselves, what important truths should continue from the book of Ephesians should continue to shape our lives as believers. And so we are going to be reviewing, starting from Ephesians chapter 1. And just before we go there, I would love to lay a foundation from something that the member text had pointed out. For we are his workmanship we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them when you think of God's workmanship what comes to mind because I believe it's important that when we read we understand where the Bible have us in the presence of God. How does God see us? It's very important for us to understand because if we don't understand to whom we belong and to whom we should be, um, we should surrender to, then we will be walking on shaky ground. But when you know your foundation, when you know your origin and your purpose, then I believe that in itself Will, 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 will give you that mindset as to how you walk in newness of life. Amen? So when you think of a workmanship, God's workmanship, how do you see yourself? Anyone? You are God's workmanship. What is that saying about you in the sight of God? My true nature is to do the things that are not pleasing to God. 
but because of his working on me and I have accepted him, um, my behaviors, uh, I have changed and I press on to do the things that pleases him and give glory to him. So in light of what she just said, she for herself, Elder Smith of himself, cannot walk in that newness of life on his own or on her own. It is the work of God in you, but it calls for something from you, and that is first believe, surrender, and obey. And if you can do that, allowing God to work in you, then this war, though seems difficult, there will be nothing that you cannot accomplish when it comes on to walking with Christ. Amen? Amen. So lesson one, uh, Sunday's lesson, talks about we are blessed in Christ. As we look at ourselves as Christians in the 21st century, individually, how, do, how are we blessed by Christ? Mm. How? What blessings are we enjoying as a result of the death of Christ? Anybody? One, we are here today on the Sabbath. Plenty, 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 plenty blessings. <laughs> That's one. Just name one. Life. I heard what? Life. life. Life, the gift of life. What kind of life? Is it just this life that we are experiencing or is it beyond this life? This and beyond. Because the Apostle Paul tells us because if it's only in this life we, we have hope, then we are of all men most miserable. Yes, so God has given us the gift of life and we are enjoying that. Praise the yes, Lord. Yes, I wanted to say that um, it is good to have eternal life and yes. that is good. Yes. But uh, when we say life, it is because we are now living. We can hear what you say. We can come to church. We can uh, just pray, praise God. Praise and, the Lord. And then this, this eternal life is meaningful for us who are living today. Yes. You know, there are so many people passing away these days, young, old, and in everybody. So the gift of life, the fact that we're in the land of the living, is a tremendous blessing. How else are we blessed in Christ? Are we chosen by him? Are we? We are cho his chosen. When, when did he choose us? So that, break that down for us. When were you chosen? Cho chosen? Before you were what? Before you were born. So coming into this world and the gift of eternal life was promised to us even before we were born. But is it, it is on condition, is it? What condition? What are the conditions for eternal life? Exactly. Belief is, is, is a very important. We also need to confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, isn't he? And what else? Can you think of anything else? If we accept him today and we turn our backs on him next, tomorrow or the next year, will we be um, able to enjoy these blessings that God has provided? So what does he call us to do? We need to be what? Not only do we repent, but after repentance, we should remain how? Faithful. We should remain faithful. It does not make sense after we have enjoyed this wonderful fellowship with Christ, after the many blessings that he has poured down upon us, and when things are going well and things just look bright and rosy, we give up, knowing very well that the days of men are only how many years? Three score years and 10. And by reason of strength, we may go a little bit further. But the end result is we are going to be out of this land of the living. So we are chosen, and as long as we are chosen, and God has given us the blessings of health and strength and life, we need to use those gifts to glorify him. And one of the reasons why it's so important that we 
surrender our entire being to glorify God as uh, Sister Ruby had pointed out. It, it brings me back to creation. Before all of this was put in place, God thought about you and I. And instead of creating us, then everything, he do the opposite. Provision. He provide for us before he place us here. Which brings me to a text that Christians often forget. Because he provide for us before he place us here, he has a right to say, seat me first. And in seeking me first, I think it's the only seeking you need to do. Because once you have him, you have everything else. So first here, I will change it and say seek him alone. Not to take away from the word of God. But just so we understand where my mind is when it comes on to surrendering to God. He placed everything here for us. So we have nothing to worry about except to seek him first. And then all these things, what things? The things he already prepared for who? For you. Then it will be given to you. And therefore, that we need to be very, very mindful of. That text so often overlooked, and we need to pay attention to it. Um, uh, eternity, Elder Smith, begins the day you were born. It, it's, 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 it's from the day you were born. As a matter of fact, when you're born, the next thing is death, um, um, physical death. One that I, I'm not even too scared of nowadays. <laughs> but what I'm scared of is the spiritual death. So what I'm saying, the, the um, eternity begins here and now, when I'm, when I'm alive, when I'm up and down, kicking, eternity should be my focus, my main focus. And even the thought of eternity was before you were created. Yes. See how awesome he is? Even the thought of you living forever with him before he even bring you here, that was already in motion. The plan of salvation, everything was there before he scratched the earth. And for man. That's how much God loves us to the point where he thinks. That's the reason why wife and husband who haven't yet had a child. Make plans for your child before you get pregnant. Make plans. How am I going to take care of this child? How am I going to lead this child to God? It's the same example that he sets before the foundation of the world. He planned ahead for us. Amen. And so the seeking brings about a very important behavior among us. It brings about this word that begins with you. It brings about what? Unity. Because God, according to our lesson, it says all things both in heaven and on earth will be gathered together or united in Christ uh, and God's plan for the fullness of time. So God is seeking to unite earth with heaven. It was intended to be like that from the very beginning. Unity between us and the angels. But we have forfeited that because of sin. But we, have, we are tremendously blessed by Christ by being in him. Everything that we ask for, he says, he will give it to us. So it pays us to be, to stay with him and be united with our Lord. Not only should, are we chosen by God, but what else has he done for us as far as Monday's lesson is concerned? He has redeemed us. How did he do that? By his life, his death, and his resurrection, because... At one time, we were described as being what? In our trespasses and sins. What were we like? We were dead in our trespasses. Dead. 
So something has to quicken us. Something has to make us alive. And what is that thing? The blood of Jesus, isn't it? The blood of Jesus that he shed on Calvary unites us, redeems us, and has uh, resurrected us from our dead condition. And he has promised us, like my brother said earlier, eternal life. It begins now, not hereafter, but our eternal life begins when? Now. We are enjoying eternal life, even now. So that is, how do we know that? Because we're still alive? We're still alive. Okay, how else <laughs> could we tell that we enjoy, we are enjoying eternal life even now? What happens when we die or we go to sleep? Do, all right, our thoughts are perish, but what else happens? We are going to do what? We are, we are going to live again. We are, huh? We have the blessed hope of living again. You know, it's not eternal death because some people will not live again. They will die again. They will die again. But those who die in Christ will rise again and live again forever. So that's how we know that we are redeemed through the blood of Christ. Had it not been for him, we would have what? What kind of hope? No hope. We would have no hope. So because we are redeemed by his blood, again, God looks upon us. He wants us to be a united body. Our lessons calls us a community. We are redeemed for community. We care one for the other. When one suffers, we all suffer. When one is happy, we all are happy. We're not called to live a life, a past life that Paul describes here in the book of Ephesians, which we, if we have time, we'll be able to review. But we are called to a newness in Christ. Yesterday, um, and something that was just said, remind me, yesterday on, uh, on, on the job, I was at someone's house. While I was paying attention to what I went there to do, I overheard a conversation. So I was eavesdropping. The conversation was a father explaining to his son and daughter about the lifestyle that is expected of a Christian. And when he, he get to a point where he said, and when you die, you rest. You're resting, you're in a deep sleep. And while he said that to them, I got up. And but in this, this family conversation, out of order, right, Sister Lois? Out of order. Anyway, I butt in. And I said, Sir, can I ask you a question? I overheard you explaining something which is very powerful to your kids. But you get to the point of death and you're resting. Are you one? This was my exact question. Are you one? who already sent mommy or daddy or any loved one that you had lost already to heaven or hell. And he said, no, no. My Bible told me that nobody is in heaven yet Amen. except those who, and I was so happy to hear him say it. And then he turned to his kids and he said, since as he brought it up, let me explain to you. Grandma is not in heaven. She is dead. That Those bones are in the grave. That's why the Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So let us hope that grandma died in Christ. Amen. And I went back, praising God, doing what I was doing. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, which we have just reviewed. In summary, the Apostle Paul wants us to live in solidarity with Jesus. But he, is he the only one that we should live in solidarity with? We should live in solidarity with who? With each other. With each other. We live in solidarity with Jesus, according to Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. 
and we live in solidarity, and we should live in solidarity with others as part of his church. The cross reminds us of that. The vertical with Christ, solidarity with Christ, and horizontal with each other. So we are the church of a living God. We are the church of a living God. Why is it both important and exciting to be a part of God's church? What does the church do for us since we are all a part of this church? What blessings do we enjoy as being members of God's church? Anybody? Okay, yes, it helps us to realize we have a hope of eternal life, and we are settled in that truth. It empowers us to do what? What does the church empower us to do? To live what kind of life? Holy lives, what else? Come on now, we all are church members, we all belong to this great church, the body of Christ. Why? What are we called to do? Why are we chosen? We are to fulfill, like somebody said over there, the Great Commission, to fulfill the Great Commission, which is to tell others about this blessing of being a part of his body, right? And then after this message has been brought to the world, what will happen? The end comes. The end of this world. And this world is about to end. We all know that. Any, anything else, uh, um, anyone else wants to share about the blessings that we enjoy as being a part of the church the live, of the living God? Spiritual encouragement. We get spiritual, spiritual encouragement. encouragement. Yes. Correction. And though some of us don't like it, rebuke, which is very important. And uh, unity which is extremely important. Amen. Because when the church is united, you are united with God and, as my sister said, with heaven. Without that unity, we scattered. And I'm not talking about unity in terms of us sitting on in the same building. I'm talking about our hearts and our minds are on one accord when it comes on to the word of God. That's the kind of unity that the church supposed to bring. Because people can pass by and look at a bunch of us sitting here. That's unity, no. Because we can sit next to somebody and we are still distant from the person. So our minds and our heart, we have to pray that God will allow the Holy Spirit to cause us to unite in such a way that peanut butter and jelly has nothing on you. That, that, that's the kind of unity. The unity where if, 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 elder, if, if, if brother, brother Wilson does something that mess with my spirit and even trigger anger, I'm so united to the point where forgiveness is easy. Embracing is easy. The brother who robbed me, I should be able to see that brother next week and buy him a lunch. That's the kind of unity that we should be thriving to have. Why? Because it is the only way we'll be able to keep the devil at bay. But we can only achieve that when our minds and our hearts are set on Christ and what he had taught us to do or still teaching us to do, and that is living in love. What is the difference between unity and different of opinion? Difference. Somebody <coughs> has a hand up over there. I think the differences of opinion is where the division starts. To start with, you have 
deviated from godly instructions. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Yeah. It doesn't say uh, generate opinions, formulate opinions. The formulation and the generation of opinions is when we think God has not supplied enough and we want to think out the situations ourselves to, avo to avoid following the instructions taught to talk. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Amen. That's where we get rest, not from difference of opinions. When we have different of, of differences of opinions, we are more than, we are opening the door to the devil to lead us astray. Amen. 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 There's a hand over there, sis. Okay. I think the difference you're looking for is the ability to agree to disagree yeah. on the least important subjects as long as the main things you can present a united front. Which means Sister even Al. if you have a difference of opinion Vassal. and you should reason it out, it must all comes back to the answer that the Bible will give. I just want to emphasize um, difference of opinion. We will always have difference of opinion. It's okay to have difference of, of opinion. But when it comes to a community such as this, even if you have difference in opinion, the majority always counts. And you have to realize even though the majority counts, you can't absent yourself because you have a different opinion. You have to be a part of the whole body, anyhow. That's, that's us uniting in Christ Jesus. Yes, it says opinion. So opinion is what I feel, what I believe. Remember Paul, Paul was on his journey, on his journey, and Mark did not go with him, and he was annoyed. That was his opinion. We say, I'm not going to take him again. But later on, somebody took him and he did well. Yeah. So if my a sister, a si this sister says that if our opinion, our opinion has to, if it don't match with what Christ says. You see, it's our opinion, but the important thing is what Christ says. And I want to think of, um, yeah, so your hand says, I think of prayer. As has been described, as Sister White also talks about it, the science of prayer. I also want to think of Christianity as a science as well. Because the end result of science is the same. It doesn't matter what it is. Math is a science, the greatest science. Two plus two is four. It doesn't matter what language we speak. Well, the end result is the same. Yes. And the end result is God is looking for his people to reflect him. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. And that's a mystery, the mystery of godliness. But nevertheless, the end result is the same for everyone. Yeah, uh, I want to approach the, the, the topic of unity as our body. On our body, we have eyes, a small organ. We have the stomach that is big with the, uh, those who, uh, the, the organs that are around it. But the, the stomach will not say the eye is too small. So, and then say something negative about it. It's about the, the body. So yes. what I can do, what my small finger can do, what my leg can do, what my big back can do. So it's about the unity. How I see things, how you see things may be different. As she's saying from Africa, from Jamaica, from America, we may see things differently, but if we have that unity that comes only from Christ, unity will be there. Good, and that is re results in the unity of the F-A-I-T-H, the faith. It doesn't matter what country, and that's what makes us, the, the, the Christianity such a beautiful thing. Yes, I wanted to say that uh, when you are un you, we are united, in adversity, we'll be able to understand each other and complete each other. Because imagine 
God created us the same way. The same culture. The same language. Yes. That would be a, a hell. To be a hell. But he wanted us to have different opinions that describes very well that we are different but united in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. Because we all are individuals. We have our own individuality. We have our own questions. And so it's important, though, that we be, in, we be united in faith. In faith. We are not against this great um, body or, or, or theology that we all accept through Christ. We are united in that. And so, there should be no division. The Apostle Paul did not expect to have any schisms or divisions among the people of God. So let's keep that in mind, that we are united. We are one body in Christ. In Christ. And he wants to unite heaven with earth. It was like that before sin came into this world. And it needs to be Return to that. And it has been promised to us that things will be made all new again. And that bond of fellowship and unity will continue throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. It's youth day, so at this time we'll, um, we will turn it over to our youth department. Thank you so very much.
for I am yours and you are mine. Oh, 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 oh. for I am yours and you are mine. Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the wall Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of a Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the wall Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet I wonder And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my feet ever wander Let me walk upon Wherever you will call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior
Amen, church. So, hmm, today is titled, well, as you guys know, who are you? So I'm just going to read this little thing so that you guys can keep it in mind with you guys as you guys go on throughout the day, but not just today, but for the rest of you guys' life. And it says, and that is who I am, a son or a daughter of God. I am a sum of all of my experiences, true. However, the memories gained and lessons learned can still get fuzzy. The one common denominator through every experience in life is who I chose to be in him. My identity is no longer in Christ, knowing that this one label will always apply. Um, I would just like to thank everyone who, particip who participated in Sabbath school today. Uh, Sister Alyssa, Sister Jadine, Sister Karina, Brother Jonathan, and Sister Jody. I hope you guys all have a pleasant Sabbath, and now we will be going into our personal ministries. Personal ministries is a time when we try to examine ourselves to see what are we doing personally to help to enhance the kingdom of God on the earth. There are several initiatives. Last week we spoke about um, the Signs of the Times campaign, which is ongoing. And for those of you who are still interested in getting a subscription or getting an or a subscription for a friend, we s you still have time to do that. We do have some more order forms for those who would like to receive a subscription. I believe the information, if it's not in this bulletin, it should be in uh, the bulletin that you received on last Sabbath. But it's, it's a good magazine. Signs of the Times have been around for over 100 years and it's been doing a wonderful job in changing lives for Christ. So if you want to have a subscription, a year's subscription, please see me or Sister Smith, and we'll be happy to share the information with you. So far this week, we have ordered a few um, subscriptions for those who have submitted your, your forms. So if you're still in need, please let us know. Our Bible studies still continue, I believe. I don't know, I think I'll have to ask permission from the youth department. But if nothing has changed, we will continue again this afternoon. Hopefully we'll start on time. Because sometimes it's not very easy to get started because of other things that are happening at three o'clock. But the time still remains 3 p.m. We are, we have ordered some books and they're not quite ready for distribution yet because we would like to get them stamped. Some Steps to Christ and, um, and the Great Controversy would like everyone to be participants in this outreach program that we will start in the near future, which we will call Operation Footprints. Because we're told in the book's Christian service, wherever church is established, Wherever a church is established, all the members should engage actively in missionary work. They should visit every family in the neighborhood and know their spiritual condition. And we are going to take up that challenge in meeting our neighbors and giving them some books, inviting them to our church, and inviting them to the love of Christ. So be prepared for when we launch this particular initiative that you will be a part of it. We do look forward to the cooperation of every member in our community. So um, if there are no further um, announcements or highlights from any departments, we are just going to bring our personal ministries at this point to a close. Thank you so much. And may God continue to bless you. And if you're in need of tracts or if you're in need of books to distribute in your community, please ask, and we will be happy to supply you 
with some things to share with your neighbors until we launch Operation Footprints officially. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church. We're going to go ahead and sing a few songs together as we get ready for our divine worship. Let's turn our hymn list to hymn number 422. We are marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join together when we all get to heaven what a day I hear you Sister Spencer of rejoicing that will be sing the wondrous love of Jesus sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed he'll prepare when we all get to heaven oh when we all, all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and while we walk this pilgrim Clouds will overspread us, but when, but when traveling days are over, when we all, 
when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing onward to onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be song that I know you're very, very familiar with. The song is simply, Victory is Mine. How many of you guys know that song? Amen. Victory is Mine. How many of you guys are claiming the victory today? I was listening to a message on yesterday by Pastor Whitley Phipps. We have to praise God now. Even in the middle, because guess what? We've already won. We have victory. Let's sing this song together. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. Victory. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan. I told Satan. Get thee. is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today. Victory is mine. One more time. Victory. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told, I told Satan, get thee behind. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We have the victory. In the name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Satan, you gotta flee. Satan, you have to flee. Tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. Tell me, tell me, who can stand before us when we call on that great name? Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, we have the victory. Oh, tell me who can stand before us when we call. 
call on that great name. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory. Amen, amen, amen. Please stand for our call to worship. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Who is this person? Christ the Lord. Amen. Oh, come, oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. For he alone is worthy. For he to be in the land of the Lord. Amen. The church is now called to worship. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then, I w then will I go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the harp, O God, my God. We will now repeat the expression of faith. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. Seventh day of the Sabbath, the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, nor thy son, nor thy servant, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that was in thy gates. For the six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day, where the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So that this was done in the world, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Bless the Lord. O oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless the Lord, O oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless His holy name. great things he has done 
Let us pray. Um, take position, whatever position is comfortable for you. Dear Jesus, you said where two or three meet in your name, you shall be there with them. The hour will come and is in fact already here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That is the kind of worshiper the Father wants. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So, so God, let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us not lose courage then. Let us hold firmly to God, for we know that we may fall several times, but because of you, Father God, we will always rise up again. Father God, we pray for the sick, the ones in pain and in distress amongst us. Lord, I so humbly ask that you have mercy on them and that you touch them with your healing grace to restore them to health. Father God, we come before you to lay our panic and anxiety at your feet. When we feel crushed by fears and worries, remind us of your power and grace. Fill us with your peace as we trust in you and you alone. For we know that we cannot be whatever it is on our own, but we know that we have you, Lord, and you have already paid the ultimate price to carry our burdens. And for this, we thank you. Father God, we thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. We thank you for your goodness and blessings over us. Thank you for your great love and care, Father God. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for you are always with us and will never leave us. Lord, thank you for your incredible sacrifice so that we may have freedom in life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for all you have given us. Father God, I ask that you renew our spirits and fill us with peace and joy. We love you and we need you this day and all the days to follow. We give you praise and thanks for you alone are worthy. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What a prayer of thanksgiving. I was the only one who heard it. What a prayer of thanksgiving. Too often, we go to God and we keep asking, asking, asking. And we do less of saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, sis, for that prayer. Good morning and happy Sabbath, family. It is indeed... Another privilege given me to stand before you this morning as your first elder. God is awesome. God is good. If I was to attempt to express his goodness, the speaker wouldn't get his time to speak. Nothing else would happen here today except me standing here and testify. And I'm sure if any one of you would have given the opportunity to stand here this morning also, it would take you eternity to express how God is good to you. Amen? And for that cause, I stand here this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. On behalf of our pastor, Pastor Best and Sister Best, and the governing body of this Hope Tabernacle Seventh-day Adventist Church, and greet you and welcome you in the mighty name of Jesus. It is on that name we call when we are in dire need. It is on that day, name that we call when we find ourselves or backs against the wall. And if you are like me, whenever time I call on his name, whatever it is that I'm going through, for some reason, I feel like I can take on the world. What a mighty God we serve. So I welcome you all this morning in the name of Christ, and I hope that as you worship with us, you will indeed experience a wonderful youth day. Our youth are shining today, and we need to encourage them. I heard a pastor in Brother Kalanda earlier when he does a call to worship. I heard it, and I felt it in my bones, sister. Trust me, brother, keep on keeping on. And for all of my young brothers and sisters, God has something in store for you all. Stay focused, stay grounded, and watch him work. Amen? Amen. Uh, for the announcements, I don't believe we have too many new announcements this week. I will ask Brother Ole to step forward just for a moment, and then I will go into acknowledging some um, visitors that are with us today. Amen, church again. 
Um, today, just keep in mind, today is definitely our youth day. We have lunch prepared for you, so please don't leave. Also, this afternoon, we have AY. Amen? At 4.30, it'll be right after Bible class. We'll have AY this afternoon at 4.30. And then following after AY, we have a social. So if you like to skate, if you got a pair at home, if you don't have any, don't, don't, don't worry, you can rent some at the skate park. We'll be going skating this evening at 8 p.m., all right? So come on out and have a wonderful time this Sabbath afternoon and then this evening. But I also want to share with you, we have something special planned tomorrow. What's happening tomorrow? Apple picking. Apple picking. What time? Hopefully you remember. Tomorrow we are leaving here. We are, listen, 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 black folk. We are leaving here tomorrow at 11 a.m. If you, if you don't, if, if, you, if, you, if you're not here, if you're here when, when we're gone, if you call me, I'll just text you the address. Amen? All right, so I'm gonna, I want to make one thing clear about tomorrow. All right? Transportation is not being provided by the church. What we did last time, what we'll do again this time, we come together and people grouped up together and they carpooled. So if you desire to drive and be there, because some people said, Ole, send me the address, I'll meet you there. That's fine. They open at 1 p.m. <clears throat> so if you want to meet us there, I'll text you the address. So what time are we leaving here tomorrow? 11 a.m. Please wear your green shirts, your wonderful, nice, hope tab green shirts. Some of you still have not received your shirts. I do have a few extras for those that had signed up for who did not receive theirs. I have your shirts, all right? With that being said, I have one more announcement to make. In December, we have something special planned for you. We have a gala being prepared for you. But I have some news I want to share with you in regards to the gala so that you keep this in mind. I'm kind of setting the tone for this one. Bruce is trying to keep you nice and soft, but I'm trying to set the tone on this one right here. It is $75. We started the promotion of this in July. Here's what I'm going to say to you. If you do not give your financial contribution by October the 15th, when we go through and we start counting, if we don't have the count, the event will be canceled. And I'm saying that with as much, not trying to be firm, but trying to be realistic. Amen? Amen. We have people who have donated already for some people who don't have funds to go. They gave. We have people that booked flights. We have people, listen, we will definitely move forward if we have the count. But if we don't, what I don't want to do is as we get closer to the date, we have to cancel it because we didn't have the funds. And I think it'd be unfair for those that are wanting to take off work or whatever, whatever. I'm trying to say this as nice and as pleasant as possible. If you don't give your financial, because I have about 70 people that signed up, but we don't have 70 people written down on paper that gave. So if you decided you want to do it and you really want to do it, your financial com contribution will be you saying, I actually want to go. And if I don't get that by, this, by October the 15th and we don't have the count, the event will definitely be canceled. Just to be fair for those that are planning that they'll know in advance. Amen, church. Amen. 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 Have a wonderful, happy Sabbath. Thank you very much, Brother Ole. And just another reminder here, on the 7th of October, we will be having communion service. October 7th, communion service. And I just want to take time out and acknowledge some visiting friends that are with us this morning. We have with us the McFarlane family. Where are you? If you don't want to stand, just wave your hand. Here we go. McFarlane family is here with us this morning. And we also have, uh, 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 there is a Kevin Lauren. Kevin Lauren. There we go. Good to have you, brother. Welcome, welcome. And uh, 
We have Akean John and Alyssa Rayon. Where are they? Welcome, welcome, welcome. And we also have uh, Renee and uh, her family. Now, I have to share this. This morning, um, Brother uh, Smart happens to go by the, 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 the office. The phone was ringing. Phone? Listen, you know where I'm going. The phone was ringing. He grabbed it. He picked it up. When he picked it up, there was a lady on the other side of the line. I'm trying to get to church. I am a family of five. I have one in a wheelchair, and I do not have transportation. Brother Deacon Hyde did not hide. He got up, he got in his car, and he went to Loganville, about a half an hour drive from here. And that family is here with us today to worship. Amen? Amen? Amen. We are indeed a loving church. We are indeed a growing church. Let's keep the positivity in Hope Tabernacle because God has called us to be a light and we are going to be that light in this community. Amen? Amen. So, having said that, can my praise team come and welcome with this beautiful song all our visiting friends. Let's sing smile together. Let's smile at each other. Let's welcome each other in the house of God this morning. Smile, everybody smile. Everybody smile. Everybody smile. Let us tell them that we love them in Jesus' name. Tell them we can work together in Jesus' name. Everybody smile. Jesus loves you. Everybody smile. Jesus loves you. Smile. Smile. Everybody smile. Everybody smile. Everybody smile. Oh, smile. Everybody smile. Everybody smile, everybody. Let us greet, let us greet somebody in Jesus' name. Let us tell them that we love them in Jesus' name. Tell them we can work together in Jesus' name. Everybody smile, Jesus loves you. Everybody smile, Jesus loves you. Smile, oh smile, everybody smile. Everybody smile, everybody smile, oh smile, everybody smile, everybody smile, everybody smile. Please stand for our opening hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Let's sing this together. Trust in Jesus, trust from sin 
myself to see just from Jesus just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus 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 how I trust him how I prove him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior and friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove thee more and more. Jesus, Jesus, Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Please remain standing for the scripture. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Come on. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. And happy youth day. Today's scripture reading will be taken from 1 Peter. 2 verses 9. I will read in your hearing, but please say amen when you find it. It states, But ye are a chosen generation, a a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath, church. Praise God. Praise God. We are now doing intercessory prayer. Um, I believe I just pray, right? Okay, okay. So for those who can kneel reverently, definitely please so. If not, it's totally fine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this holy Sabbath day. It is a blessing to be here in your presence. Lord, we know that there's been trying weeks for so many of us, Lord, but for us to just come here alive, be able to glorify you is a blessing indeed, Lord. I thank you for this congregation, Lord. I thank you for the soul and the spirit that they have in these last days to stay faithful to you, Lord. We know many are departing from our churches left and right. People are departing from the faith within our own families. But for just for this lovely congregation to show themselves in Holy Sabbath Day, it shows the testament that your spirit is still amongst your people through the world. We thank you for this wonderful youth day on a theme of who are you, Lord? And we're here, Lord, to know who are we and whose we belong to. I pray, Lord, for every single family here, Lord, that despite the smiles, the laughters, and the scenes, Lord, there could be heartache, there could be pain, there could be confusion, depression, anxiety, desperation, And, Lord, just sometimes a lack of understanding why things such has to happen. So, Lord, please increase our faith, increase our love for you. And I pray, Lord, we can continuously hold on to you, Lord. And I pray for myself, Lord, as I speak your message, Lord, let it not be me, but truly, Lord, a message from heaven sent above, Lord. I pray it can touch each youth, each adult, and each of those here, Lord, who are present, Lord, that we will not leave the same, Lord. We thank you continuously what you will continuously do through your people. And we pray for those, Lord, who are not among us today, Lord. Maybe they have strayed away. Maybe there's some youth, Lord, who have lost who they are, Lord. Lord, we don't want to be selfish with thy word and the blessings you have given us, but Lord, help us to impart what we need to reach those around us, Lord. And to not give up, but to have persistent faith in reaching to those, Lord, 
who need us the most, who needs you the most, Lord. Again, Lord, I pray for special blessings amongst this church, Lord. Pour out your spirit continuously amongst them, Lord, that there'll be a bright light and a continual bright light within this community, Lord, that souls will come to know Christ for, for their Savior. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, little boys and girls. Good morning, morning, bigger boys and girls. So today my story is standing stone. But before we get into the story, I got a question to ask you. Do you guys have a best friend? No? Okay, what's your best friend's name? Paris. Paris. How long you knew Paris? Okay, how about you? Michelle. How long you knew Michelle? Two years. Two years. Year and a half. Okay, fair enough. Ariane, you have a best friend? Who's your best friend? Uh, okay, that's sweet. Best friend? Who's it? Charlotte and Avril. That's a pretty name. Okay, so in today's story, it goes on with a best friend, but we're going to listen how it goes, okay? Okay, a story tells two friends who's walking through the desert. You know what a desert is? Okay, good. During some point of the journey, we had an argument. One friend slapped the other friend on the face. That's not nice. Don't ever do that to your best friend. Don't even do it to nobody, okay? The one who got slapped was hurt, but without saying anything, wrote in the sand, today my best friend slapped me in the face. So, yeah, engraved in the sand. Yeah, that's not nice. They engraved in the sand, today I slapped my best friend in the face. They kept walking until they found an oasis where they kept to take a bath. The one who had been slapped got stuck in the dye mirror and started drowning. So they started sinking and going under the water. But the friend saved him. After the friend recovered from the near drowning, he wrote on the stone, today my best friend saved my life. The friend who slapped and saved his best friend asked him, 
After I hurt you, you wrote on the sand, and now you wrote on the stone. Why? The other friend replied, when someone hurt us, we should write it down in sand, where the wind forgive and erased it away. But when someone does something good for us, we must engrave it in stone, where no wind could ever erase it. So today, what we learn is, write your hurts in the sand and carve your thoughts in stone. So what that means is, any bad things, let's write it in the sand so it could be blown away. And you could also ask God to forgive you when you do something wrong, and it will go away. And when you do something good, you should engrave it so like people could see the good that you do for other people. Okay, so do we have a prayer for today? Come on. Dear Jesus, please help us. Please help us to be better people. To be better people. May forgive us from our sins. Forgive us from our sins. And be respectful. And be respectful. And don't slap our friends. Don't slap our friends. And be nice. And be nice. Amen. Amen. Love's the little children. All the children of the world. Red and navy, black or white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the Gentlemen, may I have your attention? I want to introduce to you here in this corner of the good and bright stands a champion robed in white. His height exceeds the heavens. His weight awaits the world. His reach reaches everywhere. His age is evermore. He is higher than the highest. He's greater than the great. No one would ever take his crown away. God is more mighty than the mightiest. And he reigns from above. He is the all time undisputed, undefeated champion of love. He left his hometown to enter this arena. To raise his hands in victory for me Now an angry crowd who crucified This king who wore the crown And as they gladly watch the champion go down Oh, but I will never count him out For I'm a witness of the day he rose to reclaim his title, champion of love. He is higher than the highest. He's greater than the great. No one would ever take his crown away. God is more mighty than the mightiest, and he reigns from above. Higher than the highest, he is greater than the great. No one would 
never take his crown away God is more mighty than the mightiest And he reigns from above He is the all-time undisputed Undefeated champion He's the all-time undisputed Undefeated champion He's the all-time undisputed Undefeated champion of love, of Morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Will the deacons please come forward to receive the tithes and offering? We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man gifts is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern dig diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. They gave according to their means and beyond their means of their own free will. But first, they gave themselves to the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for another day. Lord, thank you for blessing us so that we are able to return your tithes and offering. Bless those who are able to forgive and those who are not able. Amen. deacons collect the tithes and offering. Come on and bless the Lord with me. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Come on and clap. Come on and clap your hands with me. Come on and clap. Come on and clap your hands with me. Come on and clap those hands. Clap. Your hands with me, come on and clap, come, come on, on and clap. clap. Your hands with me, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Many will give honor to God when they see how humbly you obey him and how faithfully you confess the gospel of Christ. Will the, congreg will the congregation please stand?
Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough there shall not be room enough to receive it. You may be seated. We give it but I own whatever gifts may be all that we have is thine alone I trust O Lord from thee Hello everyone, happy Sabbath. It is my great pleasure to introduce the speaker for today. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how I met the speaker. Um, I remember someone sent a Bible study link to join a Zoom. I joined the Zoom and it was really good. I had to reach out to him and ask him, when are they gonna have a next Bible study? So I reached out to him and a few Bible study passed, but I didn't get to go to those, but I remember he sent a link to go to Stone Mountain, and I went there, and I met some of uh, some good people. They're here today, and um, I know a few weeks before Youth Day, Miss Margaret reached out to me, and she was saying, um, "You know, you're the AY leader, so I need you to find a speaker." And the first person who came to mind was Chris, and I reached out to him and asked him if he could speak for us today, and he here, he didn't hesitate. Um, so more about the speaker. Chris Magaka was born in Atlanta, Georgia, to his father, um, Yvonne Magaka and Veronica Magaka, and gr grew up in Morrows, aka Clinton County. He has three siblings, um, O'Brien, Eric, and Beth. Chris loved to serve the Lord and see other young people come to know Christ, which thus inspired him to start a ministry called Magaka Event. Magaka event, which are events created for youth slash young adults in the Atlanta area and beyond. He wants to be known as simple, a servant, a servant who served God fully with no hesitation. That's it. You'll hear from the speaker later. We'll now have special music. Good morning once again. <laughs> I hear the sound. Of a mighty rushing wind And it's closer now Than it's ever been And I I can almost hear Hear the trumpet sounds oh, 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 oh. Cause at the midnight cry We'll be going home I look around and I can see prophecies 
At the midnight cry, oh, the bride of Christ shall rise. Sing it with me if you know the song. When Jesus steps down on a cloud to call his children, oh yeah. The dead in Christ will rise to meet him in the end. And then those that remain will be quickly. At the midnight cry, when Jesus comes again, are you looking for that day? I, I look around me, and I can see prophecies fulfilling. It won't be long. And the signs of the time They're appearing everywhere And I can almost hear my father As he says, son, go get my children Go get my children Cause at the midnight cry Oh, the bride of grace Shall Oh, when Jesus steps down On the ground to call his children We're gonna call God's children the dead in Christ will rise to meet him in the end. Well, then those that remain, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna be changed. We're gonna be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye Cause that's a midnight cry Cause that's a midnight cry Ooh, Take it up oh, Cause that's a midnight cry When Jesus When Jesus When Jesus comes On a cloud to call his children We're gonna call God's children The dead in Christ Will rise To meet him In the end Then those that remain Cause that's a midnight cry Oh, cause that's a midnight cry 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, let the midnight cry. We'll be going home. We'll be going home. Ladies and gentlemen, give the brother a round of applause. He has done a very good job. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Brother Vaughn. Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. Man, um, man, it just shows me how many, such how much talent that the youth have around us. And it's easy for a lot of the enemy to think that the youth have gone and split, but glory to God, there's youth here serving the Lord with a whole heart, selfless service. So glory to God, Brother Vaughn, and those involved, we praise God. We praise the Lord. It is a blessing to be here at Hope Tabernacle SDA Church. Again, Anna, thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited here. And definitely, Anna is correct. You know, I'm just simply a servant of God. You know, joy, just, you know, by God's grace, going around, encouraging those youth and young adults who have, of course, strayed away to come back to the fold. And by God's grace, there's also others who are doing this work here as well. And that is simply my mission. So, but I definitely do want to introduce, furthermore, uh, I want to introduce my mom. She's in the back right there. Uh, that's my lovely mother right there. Also to my dad who's online. He's in Orlando, Florida, just visiting. So to my dad, hello. And to my friends, I see some people came through. I see Ryan, Jean, Jonathan, Judy, Annie, Danelle. You know, these are great people of mine. Ryan, it was Ryan. Okay, I said Ryan. <laughs> these are great people, and those, maybe I haven't seen no faces, just want to really uh, appreciate you coming out to support. And, you know, as I'm here standing, you know, I, I was meditating on a quote earlier from early writings. And we're all going through different trials. It could be financial, it could be health, it could be family, it could be marital. And some of these problems could be very substantial. Oh, CJ, welcome. Good seeing CJ. And some of these problems can very, be very substantial. You, you can even come to the church of God on Sabbath. And, and we know that our mind is supposed to be focused on worshiping God, but sometimes the problems outweigh us. And I had the quote, but, you know, uh, the connection was a little um, tough around this area. But it was just a quote of that the children of God are in heaven. And we're all sitting like, under a huge tree. And we're trying our best to think of the greatest trial that we've been through. But the glory of heaven makes the greatest trials seem so small. So when I read that, I said, I definitely have to share to the people that the greatest trial we face right now will seem so insignificant in that great day. So may God help us to remain faithful to stay in that day. But I'll go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and get started by God's grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day your holy Sabbath day, and the youth, Lord, have decided to take charge for you, Lord. Despite not being many, Lord, we are faithful, few, and strong in the Lord. And I pray, Lord, as your remnant people, Lord, we will stay true to you in these last days. And I just pray right now, Lord, for this wonderful congregation, Lord, that you impute your spirit upon all of us, give us listening ears and hearts to receive. And for me, Lord, hide me behind thy cross and allow your glory to be revealed. Lord, we definitely need a word in these times. We need a word of encouragement, a word of power, and more importantly, a word of hope. We thank you for the elders, those who are involved here, the congregation, Lord, for encouraging the youth to continuously keep serving God, to worship, Lord, and allowing them to have a space to lift your name, Lord. 
I've been to churches, Lord, where youth have been void to serve you, Lord. But thank you, Lord, for such a church here that has given them opportunities to serve you. And I pray, Lord, many blessings and many blessings upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the message is simply called Solving the Gen Z Identity Crisis. And the generation of Gen Z is from the ages of 11 to 26. So those who were born 1995 to 2012 is what you can consider Gen Z. And if you talk to a lot of youth pastors, those who are in youth ministry, the biggest question or the biggest earnest subject that they get is a lot of youths don't know who they are. They don't know their identity. And a lot of questions can be asked is, who am I? What defines me? Does my life really matter? And Gen Z is a generation that is desperate to know who they really are. You can see it all around them in the ways they do and the way they act. And unfortunately, Gen Z is one of the most um, generations that are accepting of all identities, from transgender to bisexual, pansexual. You know, they're just starting to make things up now. And a lot of different things. And you would think that, hey, if we're accepting all these identities and we can be whoever we are and we can be however we feel, shouldn't there be no identity crisis? Shouldn't be you be, you know, like everyone should be happy and everybody claims to know who they are? But on the opposite, this generation has become the most rootless, the most aimless, the most lost, the most confused, the most depressed, the most anxious, completely lost of who they are. And they think that they have the answers. Well, I'm concerned that group. We, we think we have the answers. And by God's grace, we want to solve this identity crisis with the word of God. And I want to bring a point here. The reason why a lot of our youth and young adults are trying to find who they are is because it's a natural desire. You know, in the Garden of Eden, God gave his people three inner needs. Love. We all want to be unconditionally loved here. Despite what? Two, significance. We want all of our lives to mean, to have a purpose, to be a meaning. And lastly, we want security. We want to know that we have a sense of belonging, that people you know, accept us for who we are. So these are three God-given needs that the Lord has bestowed upon us since the beginning of time. And we're naturally, just in, in good ways or bad ways, are trying to fulfill these desires. And last, we want identity. Everybody wants to know who they are. You know, we all watch documentaries where people are just sitting there and just describing their whole experience and at the end, you can see that they're lost and confused, like a, a sail in the ocean, knowing where they're not going. So it's a natural desire. It's a natural quest and, and um, a pathway to understand who you are. And this is the age, Gen Z, where it's, you're trying your best to figure out who you are. And unfortunately, with the heart of all behavior, we try to fulfill these God-given needs in illegitimate ways. So the love, security, and significance, instead of going to God, young people are going to gangs, bad groups, sex, social media, and a lot of these different things, trying to get money, trying to fulfill these desires, trying to find the identity in illegitimate ways. And the Bible specifically says in Proverbs 14, 12, that there's a way that seems right to a man, but leads to death. But this generation is saying that, hey, let's everyone be themselves. We'll all be happy. But then you can see it all in their face. You can see in the statistics. They're not happy. We're not happy. But by God's grace, we want to solve the identity crisis. And I want to pinpoint something about social media. I know the older folks didn't really grow up with social media, but you know, now you know, we want to connect with our people. You know, we're on Facebook. But for people like us in Gen Z, we, we kind of grew up with social media. For me, I got introduced around the ages of 11, 12. Uh, MySpace came out. Who, who knows MySpace? Yeah, and I remember someone at school like, yo, Chris, everybody's on MySpace. And I was like, what's, th what's this about? Because before, my, my only social media was like, hey, my friend, like, are you, are you coming out or at school? You know, but at that time, as young people, we didn't really know how to use it. So we saw a lot of things, you know, people looking cool, people got cars, you know, young kids like us. And I'm like, man, like, man, I, I thought my life was okay, but it's really, like, not that okay. 
So believe it or not, a lot of young people in this Gen, Gen Z age, they tend to really have a struggle with comparing themselves, have a fear of missing out, it develops insecurities, and more so if they're in the age of trying to find who they are, this is not the right avenue. They're looking to the wrong people, the celebrities, the Jay-Zs, the Beyonce's, the Kyrie Irving's, all these people to help them to see who they are, and they're falling after these people when, of course, like, the only answer is God, you know? So, but you can see it all throughout. A lot of young people are following the trends of this world, and we know what the Word of God says. If we follow the world, we'll end up just like the world in damnation. So we're here to definitely solve this identity. So the question is, why is there a major, major identity crisis in Gen Z? And we're not even going to just speak about Gen Z, but why, what about the, the identity crisis within our churches? This church should be filled with young people, but it's only a faithful few. The church I grew up, you can testify to mom, we had almost 100 plus youth, young adults in that church. You go there, sometimes you might have to get some glasses to see who's still there. And the thing is, it just starts with the great controversy between God and Satan, which started in, the, in, 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 in heaven, in Revelation 12. You know, the dragon fighting with Christ. And of course, it came down to earth. Satan came, you know, Adam and Eve were tested. Unfortunately, they failed the test, and then sin came into the world. So since then, 6,000 6, years, we've been fighting between, well, there's two forces that are fighting, God and Satan. And there's only one choice we can choose, for the Lord, who's on the Lord's side, or for Satan. And that's where the young people are not understanding today is that great battle. But to be more specifically, the Word of God gives us the answer to why is there a major identity crisis. And if you have your sword, in the modern sense, I know sometimes people don't like what I say, but I call it my gun right here. 66 bullets, the Word of God. Let's turn to Luke chapter 6, and let's see where and why, is the, why do we have, the Gen Z is having a major identity crisis. And the Bible tells us very specifically, I was praying to the Lord, I said, Lord, help me to preach this word. Why do we such have an identity crisis? So Luke chapter 6, to be very specific, verses 46 to 49. So the question is, why do we have a major identity crisis within our own churches? Youth and young adults are out there. You know, you know, they're on TikTok twerking, knowing that they're made in the image of God. There's young men that are in the streets, riding scooters, riding ATVs. But when we ask them to come to church on youth day, theme, who are you? They don't want to come. But they say they're happy, though. But when you talk to them, you start to see the real root of things. So we're going to figure out this major identity crisis. So we are in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. I'll start at actually... Verse 47, and the word of God says, this is Christ speaking. He says, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. So church, remember the this first foundation, the first builder built their foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat venomously upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Verse 49, so now we're going to go to a contrast of what was um, the other thing that was built. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built in house upon the earth against which the stream did beat venomously and immediately fell. And the ruin of that house was great. And the Lord led me to realize that the reason why there is a major identity crisis is that a lot of young people are building their foundation, who they are on earth, or in some translations, in sand. And to be very specific, you know, the Bible has different meanings of, symbolic meanings of different words. And I, we're going to use the word sand instead of earth today. But according to Genesis twenty two seventeen, sand also represents people or human philosophies, opinions of the world, of those around us. And this is confirmed in Genesis twenty-two seventeen. And the word of God says that in blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand. So sand also represents 
people. And that's where the issue is. A lot of young people that are lost and confused, not knowing who they are, they're building their foundation upon sand, people's opinions, the philosophies of the world. Look into the TV stars, the celebrities, the influencers on Instagram, the IG models, those who bottle shape coat looking and saying, ah, oh, if I can be such and such. But thank God that God gives us another direction. The first builder built their foundation on what? And we all know what the rock represents. The rock represents Jesus Christ. And that's the, that's the major identity crisis. A lot of young people are not building their identity on Christ Jesus. Because think about it, if you build your identity on Christ alone, despite things happen in your life, from academics can fail, relationships can fail, you will still remain who you are. But if you build your identity on people's opinions, and one day they say, hey, you know what, I, I don't think, that, I think this about you. I think that you're bad and this and that. You will fall apart. Or if you build your identity in your career, your academics, your grades, a boyfriend, girlfriend, if those things are swept away, where, what are you standing on? So that's what's going on within our, our churches. A lot of young people, again, God, Satan is using social media as a tool, which, of course, social media has a lot of good benefits to it. But like I said, some things can be wrongly used. He's using this as a tool to sway people from understanding who they are through the Lord, thinking that the ways of this world will lead to fulfillment, the lust of the flesh, the lust of life, and the pride of life, those kind of things. So we have to build our foundation on who? Christ Jesus. Jesus. And something, you know, and, and another reason why Satan is afraid for the young people to find the true identity, so he fears them in the, these last days. You know, Sister White talks about there will be an army of young people who are furnishedly trained, will go and spread the message. And Satan is doing everything he can to stop God's people from experiencing revival, a revival of true godliness. So now what you see is so many distractions. And one of them is, uh-oh, y'all know where I'm about to get out, right? The phone. You can see, some of the older folks, when you, when you, you invite your young people to social gatherings and reunions, and do you, do, a lot of times, are they vocal talking with, with the family? What are they doing? On the phones. And there's a lot of different distractions. And sometimes some distractions can be good things. Because think about it. Sin is afraid for the youth to experience revival, to understand who they are. So it can even be in academia. Because remember, the Bible says there should be no other gods before us. Sometimes we allow the things that we're always told oh, to, to be primary or above God. Even some good things can be distraction if we allow it to be. It could be academia. It could be friends. It could be relationships. They can distract us from experiencing God for ourselves. So, again, we're fighting against a foe that swept away a third of the angels in heaven. So we have to stay close to the Lord. So, again, the question is, why is there major identity crisis? We now realize that it's because a lot of young people are building their foundation on sand, which represents the philosophies and the opinions of this world. And also, we know that Satan is doing everything he can to distract and deceive the young people, because he knows that they can finish this work by God's grace. So that's why as young people, we have to know who we are in these times, because Satan will continuously try to play mind games. And we'll talk more about that as we progress through the message. But now I want to move to my main point. So the subject was self-discovery versus God discovery. Have you guys heard that, you know, sometimes people say in, in order to find yourself, you have to look within but I'll be honest, when I was about, you know, in high school, I tried to look with Finn. And I'll be honest, I didn't like what I, I saw inside. So there's something in the world that's going on. You have to look inside to find yourself. You got to do what's best for you. You got to figure out what's for you. And this is just, you know, it's just arbitrary. This is just something that, you know, if you tell someone, and of course, there's some truth to it. I mean, Satan has some truth to what he says, but again, he makes his lie. But you cannot find your identity through yourself, in itself. But you have to go to who created you. It's like I have a problem with my Toyota, with my Chevy, and I don't know anything about cars, but I'm going to try my best to figure it out. Why can't I just go to the, the manufacturer? 
And that's what the issue of our young people are. We're, we're, we're trying to go to the world or the pains in the world, the things on social media to help us to find direction. Now we have a rise of like influencers, like these people are on YouTube and they're very influential, but a lot of them are leading a lot of people astray. Now we have things like the red pill community and a high rise of the, the, the feminist movement. And now like there's girls and, and, and young men that are that, coming to me like, ah, oh, a man shouldn't do such and such. Or a woman, you know, I'm, I'm just like, but you, 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 have, you haven't even dated yet. You're only like 12 or 13. Where, where are you getting these things from? But it's the influences that the Satan is putting through these people. So it's, we have to redirect people to Christ Jesus, which is the word of God. So self-discovery, trying to find yourself within, it's, it's, it's not going to do it. You have to go to the manufacturer. You have to. If you, you have a problem with your car, if you don't know anything about cars, well, if you, of course, you know something about cars, then go ahead and fix it. But if you don't know anything about cars, don't mess up your car. Just go to the manufacturer. And the same thing with Christ. If you don't know who you are, go to the Lord. Go to who made you. And that's what God is saying today. So now we want to talk about God discovery. Amen? God discovery. So self-discovery, no. So Ryan, Gene, and Joey, Jonathan, the young people in here, the kids, self-discovery, no. If you want to know who you are, we got to go to God. So Psalm 1611, let's go there right quick. Psalm 16, By God's grace, we are not a church that just preaches one text and the, then the Bible is closed. <laughs> We're not a church of opinion. We want to go to the word. You know, man, I should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds off the mouth of God. So Psalm 16, 11. Let's go there and talk about God discovery. Let's go. I'm almost there. Psalm 16, verse 11. I'll read in your hearing. And the word of God says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So who will show us the path of life? God, right? Not ourself, not those TikTok influencers, those Instagram models, those YouTube stars, LeBron James, Beyonce. Only Christ can show us who we are in the path of life. So we want to talk about God discovery. And we can't talk about, a lot of times we always hear like, you know, we, we always tell young people that you, you are chosen by God. You're a child of God. That's true. But a lot of young people don't even understand the God who loves them. You know, you have to first discover who God is. Then you understand how much he loves you. Because I used to hear that growing up. Young man, God loves you. You have a purpose. But at that time, I didn't really know who much God was. So it was just like, just flying straight through my ear. So the first step in identifying who we are in God is to discover God through his word. The word of God, the path of life. And I praise God for the wonderful person who read the scripture reading. I forgot who it was, but praise God. First Peter verse, excuse me, first Peter chapter two, verse nine. Let's go there right quick. First Peter verse one, two through nine. Again, we're talking about God discovery. First Peter. It's important, you know, we understand who we are in the Lord because, again, we're going through a great controversy between God and Satan. And every day he's fighting for our minds, especially for our young people's mind. So 1 Peter 1, verse 2 through 9. Two through nine. All right. And the word of God says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And there's four significant words that the word of God or Christ says to us. He says we are chosen. So young people, you are chosen by God. So when at school you feel different from your friends and your peers, you might not have the latest gear, the swag, the Jordans, or, or you might not talk like them, you might not uh, see eye to eye with them. 
you got to realize you're chosen by God. You're not meant to look like them. You're a chosen people. You're not to look like the world. He has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And the next word is you're a holy nation. God wants us to be holy. He doesn't want us to be like the world. You know, sometimes when I was growing up, I used to see these people at school. They seemed so cool. They had, especially the fellas, they had all the ladies coming to them. And I had zero ladies. And, and, just, <laughs> and I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm just missing out for real. Like, Lord, you just, you just didn't, you didn't bless a brother or something. But as I began to discover who God was in his word, I realized, hold on. I'm not meant to be like these people. Not saying I'm better than them, but I'm not meant to be like them. So we're in holy nation, a peculiar people. Peculiar means strangely different. Not different in terms of being weird, like, oh, he's just, that person just being weird, but strangely different to the world's eye. We're not meant to look like the world. But a lot of you young adults, as I go through different churches, a lot of them are trying to be so much like the world. Oh, they just released this, this new um, jeans or whatever it is. That these, the cuss, I, I got to be like them. Oh, they released this, these new shoes. I got to be like them. This new music. It's like, hold on. Like, we're the peculiar people. We're the chosen people. They should be striving to be like us, right? So that's the thing. We are peculiar people. So when people see you, you know, looking strange and, you know, you, you go to church on Sabbath or, you know, you, the way you talk, you don't curse, you know, they can talk all those different things, but know that you're a chosen people and a holy nation. We have to know who we are through the lenses of God for our young people. And he has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We all know darkness is a bad thing, and being in the light is good. So for those who are young, please, Satan is going to do everything you can to make you feel like you're missing out on what your peers are doing. But ask, matter of fact, when you go to school on Monday, Ask your friends, like genuinely ask them, like, are you sincerely happy? Are you sincerely good with where you are? I trust and believe you, you, it'll take about five, ten minutes, you will find out they're not. So you have to be the light. You have to be the light that will help them f come out from the darkness to come in God's light. So we're, again, we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And this is something that Satan is doing his best to rob God's young people. So again, those youth here, children, know who you are in God. You have a purpose. You have an identity. You have self-worth. You are chosen by God. You're special in his sight. There's this quote in, in inspiration. I don't know where it's found. But even if you're the only person that was on this world, Christ would have still came and died for you. We don't serve a God of numbers. Oh, there's 10 people, let's go and help them. Oh, it's only one person, it's not worth it. We serve a God that cares for each soul individually. So know that God sees you. Not, you're not just a speck in the universe, a random dot on this planet, a random dot in this, 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 this facility. God knows you by the numbers of your hair. So we have to know who we are in the Lord and to claim those promises. Because again, we're in this battle. We have to fight with truth to fight those lies out of our mind. And like I said, people build their, um, the world builds their opinions on the sand, which is people's opinions, people's thoughts in Luke chapter 6. So we have to fight it through the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. So first Peter, in our last verse, well, actually, we'll just stick with there. So again, self-discovery versus God discovery. Self-discovery is not good because you, you looking within yourself, you didn't create yourself. So you don't know how to of course, you don't know your potential. You don't know your purpose if you only look for yourself. God discovery, you're able to know who you are and whose you are, and you're able to live in a way that glorifies the creator and also to live a life of fulfillment by God's grace. And wonderful examples is I love the most is Daniel. And this is someone that really went through a time of testing of his identity. Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, Meshach, Abednego, and... Um, Shadrach, thank you. They were all taken captive from the home city, Jerusalem, taken into the city of Babylon, and they were stripped of that name. You know, name is very significant in the word of God. Name speaks of character, who you are and whose you are. And, of course, and they were trying to, you know, compromise their diet and other things. They were, their, their identity, they were being attacked. 
But since they had a firm foundation in Christ Jesus, a firm foundation where they knew that there was a chosen people, a peculiar people, despite all that, they remained true to God. Despite that they were trying to take away their identity and give them names that weren't even theirs and make them eat things that they never grew up on, they remained true to God. And right now we're living, of course, Daniel and them, they lived in current uh, Babylon at the time or Babylon, Babylon back then. But as God's people, we're living in spiritual Babylon. You feel like we're living in spiritual Babylon where there's a lot of confusion, where the world is trying to take who we are in God and, and they're trying to put different things on us. But Daniel and the three Hebrews, they stood firm. They knew who they were, despite the testing and the various trials and um, trying to eat the king's meat, they, they stood firm. Even when there was edicts and laws saying, hey, we have to worship the king, they stood who, for who they were because they knew God. It was God discovery they figured out. They spent time with God. They didn't allow anyone to shake them up despite the whole world being estranged. You know, they, they were eunuchs and their families were gone. They remained steadfast to God. So despite what happens in our lives, we can still remain true to God as youth and young adults, despite the circumstances. We don't have to allow the circumstances to master us, but we can master the circumstances by God's grace. So Daniel was a great example. You study, the, especially if you study um, in Prophets and Kings about this, the, the, the story of Daniel and the three boys, it would definitely shape in your faith to know that, hey, despite even everyone around me going after the world and living for the world, you can still remain steadfast to God. So Daniel was a bright example of someone. Daniel and the three Hebrews were bright examples of people who remained true to God despite their names being changed, their diets were trying to be changed, and a lot of different customs in Babylon was very contrary to the word of God, but they still stand true. So we can have the same power if we discover God for ourselves. And if you think about it, if they didn't stand up for the Lord, and this is probably my opinion, you can correct me, but I don't believe that King Nebuchadnezzar would have been saved. Because thinking about it, for them to stand true to God, despite everyone bound down, like, we got to think about it, there was other Jews there in the midst. So that means the other Jews, when it was time to bow down to the statue in, in, in Daniel chapter 3, they bowed down. But the three Hebrew boys stood firm. And King Nebuchadnezzar was like, hold on, this is something different. These people, despite the consequences and you know, there's a, a fiery furnace seven times hot. They're going to stand true to God? So it made him question, like, who is this God that th is more important than me? And by God's grace, we know in Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar finally yielded to God after many times, and, and, you know, God had to humble him. He finally gave himself to God just because those three Hebrew boys stood firm to God. So Anna and, and Jean, Ryan, Jody, and Jonathan, yeah, people might laugh at you. You know, kids, all, all those, people might laugh at you just because, you go to church on Sabbath. People might laugh at you because you, 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 you're not cussing or you, you're not having premarital sex. But best believe there will be some people that are looking at your life and say, this is something different. This is something new. Who is the God you serve? What church you go to? Hope Tabernacle SDA Church. That's how it is. So that is how we draw people from the world to Christ. It's about our lives to shine our light to the world, which is our very own lives, so people can see it and come to Christ. And the most important, and that's the reason why the most important, we have to know who we are. And that's why, again, I said Satan is very fearful of the youth, because if youth know their tr true identity, many young people from the world will come to the light. If you see on social media, there's people now, there's, there's a group, of, a, 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 a movement of young people that are now starting to um, be bold for the gospel. They're preaching the word. Matter of fact, our young brother here, CJ, he has a great Bible study group called COG, COG, Children of God. And there's young people from his college's campus, those around, you know, who are, don't understand the gospel, but are coming in. It's because when we, you, we take a stand for God, of course, the world, most of the world might not, they will oppose it. But we know that there's some out there who are thirsting and seeking for truth and light. So there's always pros to stand in truth of God. We know there's consequences against the, you know, the, the worldly structures, but at the end, it's always eternal, um, eternal blessings. So let's stand for the Lord and let us know who we are and let no one take our identity from us. Because again, the world, Satan, is trying to put people's opinions and thoughts to us.
And speaking about people's opinions, uh oh. I believe this is one of the main tactics he does to our young people. And I'm living testimony. You know, I grew up, uh, thank you again, Anna, for the introduction. I grew up in an environment where a lot of kids obviously didn't know who they were. You know, it's true what they say, hurt people hurt people. You know, I would come to school. I mean, I, 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 I had decent clothes. I don't, I don't know why. I, I look sometimes back there, I'm like, I, kids were making fun of me. But I, I look back, I'm like, oh, no, I had decent clothes. But kids was just coming and just no one wanted to sit with me. And people were joking, laughing. I remember one girl, like I was, you know, they were like, Chris, come sit next to, um, I won't say her name, but well, her first name was Jessica. Like, come sit next to Jessica. And I remember, like, I sat down, her desk was right next to me. She completely scooted over. She was like, I don't want to do anything with you. So I, those years progressed. I started to progress more of a lower, lower self-esteem. I tried to do my best to fit in. You know, I tried my best to stay with the current trend. Tell my mom, hey, just, I just want the latest phone. I, I didn't even want a phone just for, for the phone's purposes, but just to look cool. And it's funny, Christopher, you know, it just, as I continue to progress, you know, God definitely, like I said, God sees us individually. You know, God sent people in my life, like my older brother, or at the time, like my half-brother who I came to meet, to remind me of who I am in the Lord. That I, I don't have to have the latest J's to be, to, be a, to be someone. I don't got to be the most popular person in school to be acknowledged. I don't have to have uh, two girls, one right here, one right here, to be, to, to be the man. And that's what God does. He reminds who we are, and by God's grace, over time, I started to build genuine, godly confidence. Not worldly confidence with ego and, and pride and, and I'm this, I'm that, but genuine, godly confidence. And that's, for our young people, that's what God is trying to do. He wants to build that. He wants to take you out from the world because he knows you have a purpose for these times we live in, to help those around those who don't know themselves. So I'm living testimony from someone who was lost, confused, trying to fit in, trying to look like everyone else, feeling like, oh, I'm really nobody, to figure out going to the word of God. I'm actually, man, I'm more than someone. I'm a child of God. I'm a chosen generation. Royal, holy, peculiar, to go out to call people from the darkness into his marvelous light. So young people, please don't let, when we go to school on Monday, if, if, if people are saying things that are negative, rude, nasty, go to God. Say, you know what? Those are your opinions. I'm going to go to the word of God. I'm going to go to the truth, what God says about me. Because you have a purpose. And the reason why Satan is attacking our young people like another, especially at SDA youth, because he knows that there's a work for them to do. I'm telling you, he's doing everything he can to destroy that work, and he's using people's opinions and people's thoughts. Because the reason why he does that is if you allow that truth, not excuse me, if you allow that opinion to steer into your mind, it becomes a reality in your life. Thoughts turns to feelings, emotional, negative feelings. Feelings turns to actions. You start feeling... I'm not saying you, 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 you start behaving in a way that's not who you are in the Lord. You lack confidence. You, you don't know who you are. And of course, those things turn into habits. Satan fears you all tremendously. So that is why he's doing everything to just tear you from the path. And I just want to go to my next point right quick. These are my personal five signs of identity in Christ. Because like I said, I went from being someone who was insecure, um, you know, very, you know, didn't know who I was, didn't know my purpose, trying to fit in, you know, felt lost and confused to being more firm who I was. And I'm still growing in Christ. We're all growing in Christ. We'll keep growing in Christ until he comes. But these are the five signs I believe that this is someone who is truly has a true identity with Christ. And number one is being content despite the season. You might not have the, the, the best suit, the best clothes. You might be single and all your friends around you is in relationships. You might not have a hundred thousand, a million dollars in the bank account, but you know who the God you serve will provide. You know who the God you serve 
that those things don't define you. So the first sign of someone who's really knows identity in Christ is contentment. And we know this in 1 Timothy uh, verse 6 through 6. We don't have to go there. But contentment is a sign of someone, yes, of godliness. It's great gain. It's contentment. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with desiring things. God allows the desire things that are healthy and they won't affect our spiritual um, walk with him. But we should be content each season. That's how you know someone who is truly puts our identity in Christ. Because you see those in the world, they're always trying to get more. Oh, I just got this new ch- this, this check. I, I, just got, I, just, I just cashed out. I, I need to go get more. Oh, even some friends, I have some friends like, oh, yeah, my girl is beautiful. Oh, she's, she's so beautiful. I need me a side chick. Hold on, you just, you got the most pleasant and wonderful girl in, 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 in the school. Now all of a sudden you want to go to this high school to get another side chick. It's like, how much more do you need? Because they're not satisfied. They, they don't know who they are. Their identity is built on sand. They have to get more and more to feed that flesh. But if, you was, if their identity was firm in the rock, you, you're content. You might desire, of course, the good things, but you know that at the end of the day, those things don't define me. It's God. So contentment is the first sign that someone has identity in Christ. Number two is negativity or people's opinions have a less impact on you. So from coworkers, some, maybe some family members, to some people around us, we know Satan's going to, you know, t- touch them a little bit to go in and, 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 and push our buttons. But a lot of things, most of the times, they won't, if we're really firm in the Lord, those things won't really hit us as such. We don't have to take it personal. You know, because those are just opinions. As long as it's not affecting our family, our health, or our bank account, they can keep their opinions to themselves. But a second sign is negativity towards you has a less impact. That's a sign of someone who has their um, identity in Christ. Number three is insecurities are minimized. We, we all have insecurities. We all have insecurities. But as we continuously know who we are in God, we can have godly confidence. Not confidence of ego and pride like I was saying before, but godly confidence. Number four is that grades, career, and relationships, if those things don't work out, you're not devastated like, oh, I'm just depressed. I had friends like in elementary school, like they would be straight A students, always getting straight A's. And I had one of those friends who they would just get a B, and believe it or not, they just, it's like they just having a whole panic attack. i like perfectionists, you know. But if we really root in Christ, if any of you got that B, even you got that C, it doesn't define you. You know, I, I even know some people, like, it was in, like, a serious relationship. Things happen. Breakup. Major depressive episode. Suicidal. And I know those things can be tough. I'm, we're not trying to belittle people's, um, what, they've, what they've gone through. But it shouldn't come to the point where your whole, you, you feel like your whole life is over. Because they built their foundation on sand, on earth. When the storms of life come, the house is going to fall. But if it's in Christ, of course, yes, those things hurt. Yeah, you, you might suffer with bad grades. The relationship might happen. The career is not going the way you want to, but you still know who you are in the Lord because your foundation is on Christ, the rock. Number five, a sign of identity in Christ is the fruits of the Spirit. Love. Love in your life. Even those who wrong you, still love your enemies. Blessing those who curse you. Doing good to them that hate you. Praying for them which despiteful use you and persecute. You, you show these things because you know that and they, if people can do whatever, but you know who you are in God. You know where you're going. Having joy. You know, I, I, I work, where I work, you know, a lot of times you can see the misery in people's faces. You can see it. And one time someone's like, man, my brother, why are you just always, always happy? You know, and I just told him honestly, you know, just to, to witness. I said, it's, it's Christ. Christ in my life. So having your identity, I mean, signs of identity in Christ is having those fruits of spirits, love, joy, peace, patience, long serving, gentleness, goodness. Those are evident. So if we have those things, and as we teach our young people to develop a relationship with God, to develop these spirits, I mean, these, um, these fruits, no matter what happens, it, just, it can be hard, but they can still know who they are, and they don't have to be emotionally devastated or wrecked or feel like the whole world is falling apart. And lastly, I just want to move to my last point of who we are. And that is our identity as seven-day Adventists. You know, a lot of, you talk to a lot of 
Adventist youth, and you ask them, what is an SDA? They always tell you, oh, well, we're just people who keep Saturday as the Sabbath, which is true. I'm not saying it's not true, but it's more to being an SDA. You know, and a lot of young, the reason why a lot of youth, young adults, they're, 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 they're there's, I mean, I have friends that, who have left Adventism, or they don't have, or they don't validate, not validate, but they don't acknowledge spirit of prophecy. You know, there's a lot of young people, you bring up Ellen White, they're gone at that door. And a lot of times it's just because upraisings, you know, people use the spirit of prophecy as don't do this, don't do that, such and such. So a lot of young people have something, you know, can develop something called like religious trauma, which is, you know, whatever something that happened in the past and if it reminds them of that past, they don't want to hear it. But it's a beautiful thing to be an Adventist. There's not a random organization we're part of or a movement we're part of or just something that was what they say, people say, oh, it's a man-made movement. It's orchestrated from God. And it's important our young people, youth and girls, we have to understand the origins of the faith we believe in. Because believe it or not, there's people out there, they're, they're, the people who are not of our fold, they will question you. Oh, what's the Adventist? They will try to get deep. And if you don't really know who you are, it's easy for Satan to use them to sway you out from that. And I see it all on YouTube. I see videos of people who are, I was 30 years in SDA. I, matter of fact, there's even some pastors. I was a pastor for SDA church for 20 years and such and such, such and such. And Satan is using these people to sway them from the truth. Because again, the most fearful church Satan is afraid of right now is a seven-day Adventist. It's because the message we have, the light that you know, God has revealed to his people, that we're to show to the world, Satan's afraid. That's why I was saying that Satan's afraid of our young people. Because if they're able to know who they are in Christ first, and then to know who they are as Adventists, that is a dangerous threat to the enemy. The Bible says that you know, the, um, Satan is wroth with the church, very angry with the church, and seeks the woman which is the church. So it's important to know who we are as Adventists. So something I recommend is, um, well, before even going to the five conflict ages of series, even read a message to young people. You know, that was the first book I picked up, you know, of Spirit of Prophecy. And it, it really related to me. You know, I was like, wow, like, these are things, of course, sometimes people are like, oh, man, she wrote that book back then, man. We in 2023. We got, we, we in New Age, but a lot of those principles still applied. It helped me to shape, you know, who I was as a young Christian. You know, that's a great book to, uh, to, to pick up. And of course, then going through, the, you know, Patriots and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, y'all know about that. You know, Desire of Ages, uh, it's, it's good, good stuff. Acts of the Apostle and Great Conscience, just to know who you are in this divine movement. Because we're not only just to call people from the world into Christ, but to point them back to the Decalogue. The fourth commandment. You know, I have a lot, I've, I've been meeting a lot of people. Like sometimes a lot of people are just in ch Sunday churches or churches just because they grew up there or it's just tradition. But I've been having conversation. I, I mean, just, I, went, I met this young lady at Moe's and she was doing my food and stuff. And she kind of figured out that, you know, I was a little bit um, you know, different because she, you know, she was like, Do you want cheese? I was like, No. Um, Do you want uh, this right here? I was like, No. She was like, Are you like vegan on plant place or something? And like, yeah, I'm plant-based and stuff. And then she's like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And then she was like, um, like, are you like a Christian or something? I'm like, yeah, I'm SDA. And, you know, she was quickly going through the line, this, that. And she was like, okay, um, what's SDA? And I was like, yeah, you know, we keep the biblical Sabbath, Saturday, and all that, you know. She's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know the biblical uh, day of worship is Saturday. So that shows us there's a lot of people out there that just don't know. So that's why Satan fears us. Because we have a light that the world needs. There's people who are genuinely, if they can just give an opportunity, can be pointed back to the truth. So that is what, as Adventists, we're commissioned to do. And I just want to read this before I close, uh, which is from the book. Well, it's the book is Last Day Events, but you know, it's Last Day Events is composed of different um, Sister White's um, writings around. It's a it's a composition. So. From the Testimonies of Church, Volume 5, she says this. This is the distinctive mission of Seventh-day Adventists. The Lord has made us the dispositories of his law. He has committed to us sacred and eternal truth 
which is to be given to others in faithful warnings, reproofs, and encouragement. Again, we are a chosen generation, right? For these, 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 these times we live in. And she continues, she said, seven day Adventists have been chosen by God, not by people. So for those who can say, oh, this is man-made religion, blah, 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 you can allow them to continuously talk that and, and you focus on what you're doing. But we've been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. So we don't have to be like the world. Because I've seen churches, I've been to churches where in order to win people and win young people, we got to compromise a little bit there and there. Let's make a production. Let's do such and such so they can draw. We don't have to do that. A lot of young people, believe it or not, if you just open the word of God and you're genuine and you're loving, man, they will come quick. You don't need a, a whole, like, we don't have to spend $5,000 to decorate this room. You, know, you, know, we, you don't have to do that, you know? Because we're, we're, if we're separate from the world, people, people look at us like, hold on, like, what's different about you all? But she, she's, she continues, we're separate from the world by the great clever of truth he has cut out from the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. He has made us representatives, and he has called us to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. So the world is dependent on us to expel this truth to this world, to give this truth to the world. Because there's, no there's no other church out there that does it. The other day I was talking with um, a fellow Adventist. He was like, we got to stop saying, hey, um, Brother Chris, we got to stop saying we're the remnant people. And I'll be honest, like I said, there's people who have, they don't know their identity. We are the remnant people. Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patient of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Are we keeping all Ten Commandments? Are we keeping the Fourth Commandment? You know, so there's confusion going around even amongst our brethren. So we have to stay true to the Word of God and also to the spirit of prophecy. And we have been, again, she continues, she said, the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to us as Adventists. Just think about it. Every significant event that Christ, I mean, the word of God says, uh, well, the word of God has put from, um, like, Noah. You know, Noah was a messenger sent to answer Luvins to tell him, hey, the flood is coming. Get in the ark. It was that simple. That was the present truth for that time. Or John the Baptist, to prepare people, a voice crying out from the wilderness, preparing the people for the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. That was a message for those people at the time. And if they choose to accept it or not, it determined their destiny. And the same for us. We are like John the Baptist. We are like Elijah's of these times, to prepare people for the second coming. So as young people, we have a distinct mission. We are not just some, oh, SD. Not all, we, I hear this all the time, and it is true. Some people are like, oh, not all S, just because you're SDA doesn't mean, well, they say um, not all people who go into heaven are SDAs. That's true. What, no, that's not true. Well, no. They, <laughs> let, me, let me step back. Let me step back. They, always, they say like, oh, just because you're SDA doesn't mean you're better than such and such. That's true. But we have a distinct mission. We have a distinct role. And if we understand the role, we won't be tempted to go to these other churches. Because I've seen, I've had friends who left the faith and went to these other churches. And I just, I just, I, I just got to tell them, be honest. Like, you know, that's just not the word of God. That's not the truth. Like, there's, there's, a, there's sincere people in Babylon. We all know that. There's some people, some sincere people who are out there and worshiping genuinely. But we, they're, they're, it's, not, it's not genuine, true spirit of worship. It's not according to the fourth commandment. And that's what Christ has called us to do. As young people, we have to study for ourselves. We have to study so we can help them to know what the truth is. And just to finish, she says that in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. Light bearers by your lives, by the way you live your, our, we live our lives. Watchmen. Look at all the signs around us. There's still people who are still asleep spiritually. You hear people saying, ah, in 10, 15 years, man, I just want to be rich, such and such and such. If you really was just someone who just looked at the signs, studied Matthew 24, studied the different 
prophecy of the word of God, you know that Christ is right there at the door. We got to be watchmen. We got to wake people up because people are really spiritually asleep. I had a friend, matter of fact, she, she, I was texting her. She was like, I'm going through a lot of things. And she was like, she's lost a lot of friends. And I told her that the Lord has revealed me, revealed me to you that you're going through a season of isolation and separation. He's trying to call you out from the darkness into his light because he's soon coming. She's like, oh, do you think Jesus is coming soon? I just said, look all around. Look at the commie. Look at the wars. Look at the signs. You know, Christ is not trying to just, just completely surprise us. He's given us evidence of his coming. So we're called to be watchmen, light bearers. To them, we have been entrusted the last warning of a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. So Joe Biden, the president of the United States of America, does he have the most important work? <laughs> no. Adventists, we have the most important work in this world. And they have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and three angels' message. So as young people, we got to understand the first and second, third angels' message. We got to go to Revelation 14, verse 6 through 12, to understand. Because think about it. If we understand these truths and we're fired up for God and we go out to help our other young people, many people will be able to accept the truth. So that's why he distracts us with the phones, with the movies, with the Kyrie Irvings and all these people, the Beyonce concert, the Drake concert that came the other day. I've, I've seen, man, I've, I've seen fellow friends who will run to these concerts quick, but when it's time for a, a revival night, an all-night prayer, nowhere to really be found. Nowhere to be found. But praise God. I believe there's young people, Anna, Charlotte, uh, Christopher. I mean, I like your confidence, man. Praise God. It's, man, no, no matter how few the people of God can be, how few the young people got, God, God can use the few and turn them to be mighty. Like Gideon, from 30,000 to 300. God, I, I, like I, God doesn't, it's, he's not a numbers guy. He's not, oh, we, we only have 10 people. We're, we're, we, we need to figure out. He will use who's faithful. So God bless the youth and young adults here at this church. But again, as Adventists, we have a distinct mission and purpose. We have to explore who we are, of course, number one, in Christ Jesus, and who we are as Adventists to understand these truths. Because now if we understand these truths, we can go to those who are around us and bring them to the fold, to expel these truths to them so they can come in the fold. So again, I just want to just kindly conclude that we're, none of us are a mistake. None of us are here by accident. Despite how life may have shaped us or allowed to happen, God has put destiny and purpose in our lives. And it is Satan's purpose to conceal that true identity. He tried to do it through me. I try to find fulfillment through academics, the careers, to money, to the opposite sex, and nothing still filled inside. But when I saw that light and I figured about God discovery, and that wasn't defined by how much I had in my wealth, my, my wealth fargo, my wealth fargo bank account, or my the shoes in my sneaker closet, or my friend circle, or my Instagram, how many followers I have, I start to find more confidence and more security in myself. And the simple reason is just he's the manufacturer. He made you. He knew you wasn't in your womb. You know, so our young people, our children, man, God has so much, to, so he has so much blessings in store for you. But it's us as a church's responsibility to show them the word, show them who they are in the, in the Lord. Because I'm telling you, God, I see it, I see it. He's, he's ready to pour out his spirit amongst those who are faithful. We're going to start seeing young people that will go to various churches, bold Crages, going to different churches, large gatherings, to preach the word, to evangelize, to sing for the Lord. And many souls will come in the fold. And that's what Satan is very fearful of. That's why we see so many temptations, all these different things. So the Lord is saying, let's stay focused. Let's make it. It might be hard, but it's worth it. It's always worth it if it's God involved. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for reminding of us who we are in Christ Jesus. Lord, you knew us even before the foundation of this world. You knew that we'd be here in 2023 still striving to live for you. And Lord, Satan is trying to take away what is ours, which is knowing our day in you, Lord. And Lord, it's, it's sad. It's heartening to see those around us in the Gen Z age, in the church, not realizing who they are. But Lord, we thank you for the faithful who are here. And it's up for us, Lord, by your strength and mercy to stay true and faithful. Because just as the three Hebrew boys stood for you, despite a contrasting society, we can stand for you, Lord, and people can see that marvelous light in our lives and come to you, Lord. I pray for the youth here, Lord, the children. Please, Lord, install your spirit and remind them, Lord, that they are chosen. Lord, that they're peculiar people, a holy nation, Lord, because you have called them out of darkness in your marvelous light, Lord. I pray for the elders, the leadership here, Lord, that they will continue to allow your spirit to move them and lead them and, and help have more programs for them. And Lord, I pray that at the end of the day, Lord, we want to make it. We want to be found faithful when you come, Lord. So allow us to remain faithful now and here and then until we all meet you in those skies, Lord. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. What a beautiful sermon and testimony. Just before we go to our closing song, I think it's appropriate, I think it's important for us to ask our young people, our children, our youth to come forward and for the adults to surround them. I'm going to ask our first elder to come forward and pray. Let's pray for our young people. Our speaker, Chris. And we'd like to just ask all our youth, all our children, please come forward, please come forward. We'd like for all our adults to surround our children and we'll pray for our youth, please. I'm also gonna please. ask our elders to be Elders part of this. or adults, please come forward and let's surround our youth as we pray with and for them. It is not easy. The times where when we grew up, when we were young, we had much less distractions. I didn't have a phone. I mean, that came in long after. I was already an adult. I didn't have all these distractions. And our young people are dealing with a whole lot more than we can even think or imagine. And so we ought to embrace them. And as we go through today, I just want to say this one thing. Please, whatever it is that is negative, Whatever it is that you see that went wrong, say a prayer. Say a prayer. The only words you should be mentioning, we should be saying to our youth and our children, is that of encouragement and affirmation. That's it. Anything else, just say a word of prayer and keep it to yourself. Let's pray. And just before we pray, I just want to give God thanks for the youth today. I want to thank my brother out there for preaching in his songs. The brother that preached in his songs. I want to thank him. And I want to thank you, sir. May the anointing of God continue to flow on you. And in you and around you. And I pray that the job he placed in your hands, you will indeed carry it out until he shall come and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Hope Tabernacle had watched and seen a lot of youth pass through this church. Some are in college. Unfortunately, some drift from the faith as he preached. But if we pray, God will deliver. And our youth are coming back.
But for those that remain adults, let us be the examples that God called us to be so that we can shine that light so that when our kids saw a glimpse of darkness, they know that it's coming from the pit of hell and they will indeed do what the speaker say. Pray and make sure your anchor is in the rock, Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you did it again. You showed up. You show out. And we thank you. We thank you, dear God, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the words. We thank you for the songs. We thank you for the amens. We thank you for the hallelujahs. We thank you, dear God, for the worship experience that you had brought in our lives today. We thank you for the message. We thank you for the teaching, the lesson. We thank you, dear God, for everything that you had placed before us. You spread a table and you ask us to eat. And we are going to eat knowing that there will be no indigestion. And Lord, as you spread this table in the presence of our enemies, who is the devil, we know all he can do is watch us eat. So help us to feast. Help us, dear God, to get all the nutrients from your words so that our spiritual well-being will be intact. Father, I pray once more for your anointing and each and every one. I pray for the parents who are trying so hard to direct their children, to cause them to want to stand firm for you. I pray, dear God, that you will bless each home. You will bless each school, each workplace that our kids will pass through. And I pray, dear God, that at the end of our time here on earth, we will all hear the sweet voice of our Savior saying, Well done. Come he blessed in my Father's kingdom. Father, again, we place our youth in your hands. Cover them. Wrap your arms around them. Anoint them, dear God. Empower them, dear God. And educate them in the truth. And have us all to understand that we belong to a great God. And there is nothing that can separate us. Have thine own sweet way with your people today. And this I do ask in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. And all of God's children, open your mouth and use those voices and say amen. 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 You may be seated. Our closing hymn is number 306. 306. Draw me nearer. Keep standing. Remain standing, please. Remain standing. I am thine, O Lord. I am heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith. And be closer, drawn to me. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. May my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, oh, the pure delight of a single heart that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, 
I commune as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Thank you for that wonderful message. Now let us all bow our head for the benediction prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and praise. We thank you for food, shelter, clothing, and knowledge. If it weren't for you, Lord, we wouldn't be here. Thank you for letting us see you another day, and we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. As the ushers lead you out, please remember that there's food in the back, so don't go home. Good food. Come on and bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless. Come on and bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless. Come on and bless. The Lord with me, come on and bless, come on and bless the Lord with me. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands with me. Come on and clap, come Those on hands. and clap your hands with me. Come on and clap come those hands. And clap your hands with me. Come on and clap, come on and clap your hands with me. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and dance with dance before the Lord. Come on and dance, come on and dance before the Lord. Come on and dance, come on and dance before the Lord. Come on and dance, come on and dance before the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 Remember, we have AYS at 4.30, and we also have, before that, Bible class at 3.30. So don't leave. Lunch is served. We have the entire day planned for you. 